Hi, everyone. Um, my name is JC, uh, and some of you may have seen me before, some of you may not have. Um, so I'm one of the co-presidents of the International Graduate Student Association at McMaster University. Uh, the other co-president may be in the attendance, it's Sebastian, so maybe you've interacted with him as well. So today I'm really, really happy to have Elizabeth and Zia uh, on this webinar to tell us more about immigration, what we have to know about immigration during COVID-19, the ways to get PR, uh, if, despite the pandemic and everything like that. So typically we would have a room, we would have food, we would have drinks. It would be a lot more casual. You would have a lot more chances to interact directly with Elizabeth, but I'm still really happy that we were able to pull this off and have a webinar in a virtual form. Um, so Elizabeth is a leading immigration lawyer in Canada. She has been an active advocate for uh, immigrants and refugee rights uh, all over in Canada. She's frequently presented and she presently advi advises on immigration issues to organization, universities, member of parliament's union and media. She has also testified several times before the parliament standing committee on citizenship and immigration on various immigration policies. In addition to that, she's also been certified by the Law Society of Ontario as a specialist in citizenship and immigration law, which is a prestigious list that only has 50 lawyers in Canada. So I'm extremely happy to have her here on the call. She'll tell us everything we have to know. I'm sure it changes every day. It must be extremely complicated. So I'm really happy that we have a specialist to tell us more about everything today. Thank you. Thank you so much, JC. Well, um, I don't know about you, but I was uh, checking some of these election results down south and it's you know constantly changing. And um, one of the first thoughts I had uh, yesterday when I wo woke up was A, what the hell happened? And then B, I thought, okay, well, we better you know, have a newsletter out to people to tell them how to come up to Canada. Because uh, it's, it's um, you know, it's right now, you guys are in a very, very good spot to um, immigrate to Canada. Um, we still have to do a lot of planning, which is what we're going to go through today. Um, but there's going to be a lot more competition, a lot of people who, who also want to come to Canada as well. Uh, so I just wanted to explain to you guys how we're going to do things today. Um, I'm going to be presenting, I'm going to put my presentation up on, on the slides up very shortly. And then Zia, who is our um, wonderful uh, immigration lawyer at our firm as well, she is going to be answering your questions that you can, if you just press the Q&A on the bottom, you can put in your questions there and Zia is going to answer them while I'm presenting. And at the end, uh, we'll have an opportunity for Zia to uh, maybe discuss some of the questions that you might have had as well. Okay. All right, let's get started. Okay, so what, uh, what should you know during, especially during these uh, crazy times? Um, I always like to start my presentations with a few things that you need to know before we talk about PR. And the first thing I want to talk with you guys about is implied status. So if you guys are currently temporary residents, you have a study permit, a work permit, or visitor status, there will be an ending to your status. And you can find that on your study permit or your work permit or visitor record. So what implied status means is if you apply to extend your status before it expires, let's say you apply to extend your study permit before it expires. Let's say my study permit actually ends um, at, uh, uh, at, let's say December 31st, okay? And then um, my study permit ends on December 31st, and I apply to extend my study permit, let's say December 30th. The website says 30 days, you should put it in, but that's just a recommendation. That's not the law. The law actually is, as long as you apply before it expires, then you can continue on. That's called implied status. You can continue on to study until a decision is made, okay? Now, what happens if 
let's say, you know, I'm very busy with the exams, right? I'm, I'm studying for my exams. And then afterwards, I go party. It's, it's Christmas and New Year's. And then New Year's Day, oh, I have a hangover, first of all. And then I just happen to think, okay, I'm going to check my study permit and shoot, it expired. Okay. What can you do then? Well, okay, you have normally 90 days to restore your status. 90 days uh, to restore your status from the date that your status ended, okay? During COVID times, this year, the government has given a special leeway for those people who have lost their status after January 30th to restore your status within this year. But normally, it's 90 days, okay? So it, let's take my example a little bit further. Let's say I did apply to extend my study permit uh, let's say on December 30th. So I can continue to study in Canada. But then I, um, I, let's say I uploaded the wrong passport and I got a denial on February 1st. What happens then? First of all, my status, my status starts counting. The 90s days start counting not when my study permit expired, but when I actually got the decision because I extended my status. So it starts counting on February 1st, okay? So I have 90 days from that, but after my I lose my status, even though I apply for restoration, let's say I apply for restoration right away. While I'm waiting for restoration, I cannot study, okay? So first thing that you wanna do is try to make sure that you apply properly uh, before your status ends and you pay your proper fees, you, you, you submit the proper forms, okay? That's, that's uh, very, very important. And then you know the restoration timeline. Normal, normally it's 90 days, but special policy uh, for this year, okay? The second thing I wanna talk with you guys about is the difference between high-skilled and low-skilled work. You know, I just had someone come to me the other day where they thought they were doing high skilled work. They had gotten a master's in Canada and they um, were on their post grad and they were in the last year of their post grad. And, you know, they ha he had been working as a security guard and he told me, his manager told him, you can get permanent residence, you can get immigration that way, don't worry. And he trusted his manager. And then afterwards, he found out that security guard is not a high skilled job, okay? He wasted basically two years, two and a half years of work in a low skilled job. And that's exactly what I wouldn't want you guys to do because right now as when we talk about permanent residence, you'll see that there's a big difference between your ability to immigrate with a high skilled job and a low skilled job. Okay, and don't just take for granted what you think is a high skilled job. All of the um, occupations are coded under the Canadian immigration laws. Even though your job may not fit exactly into some of the occupations, we have to, when we apply for permanent residence, find the best fit. And under the codes, O, A, and B are high skilled and C and D are low skilled. And some of the things that you might think are high skilled, for example, you might think, okay, well, a secretary, is that high skilled? Yeah, it's high skilled. How about a receptionist? That's low skilled. How about a data, an, a data uh, entry clerk? That's low skilled. Um, how about a bookkeeper? Well, that's high skilled. A county clerk is low skilled. Okay, so as you can see, oftentimes it's not just intuitive whether or not something is high skilled or low skilled, for your purposes, you must figure out what not code your work, whether you've done it previously that you might get credit for, or very importantly, in the future, if you get a job offer, if you're working in that job, is that going to be high skilled or low skilled? All right, I wanna go through a few rules that is happening during the pandemic. And you know, I've been doing, webinars for various schools throughout this entire time. 
And every time, you know, it could be a matter of a few weeks difference, my slides change uh, for this portion of it because the rules are changing very, very fast. So the first one, I don't know if all of you are here in Canada or not, um, but if you're not, um, I, I just checked the, the list yesterday. And as of November 3rd, McMaster University is on the COVID ready DLI list. This means that if you have a study permit approval, you can actually travel to Canada now, okay? Can I, can I jump on that real quick? Yes. We actually received an email from Yufe yesterday about exactly about uh, this. Uh, and if you are, if you want to come to Canada, you have to get in contact with Yufe. There's a whole website that explains the quarantine plan and everything. So this is extremely important that if you're coming to Canada because you're approved and you can travel, make sure you contact Yufe. I'll put her email address in the chat. Uh, and we got an email from her yesterday. So that's extremely important. Thank you for Wonderful. mentioning yeah, absolutely. There's a, in order to be on the COVID ready DLI list, the DLI has to be COVID ready. That means that they have to make sure that you guys are going to be self isolating, etc, and, and have all of those um, uh, provisions for you when you come to Canada. So please do contact um, that contact that JC will put on the chat. Okay. Um, now, if you are still waiting for your study permit to be issued. Um, what they have announced is that as long as you eventually have your study permit approved, if you start studying now and you have already uh, submitted your application, then if you're studying outside of Canada, um, that those studies, even though you don't have your study permit approved yet, will count towards your post-grad work permit um, for uh, this semester and for the next semester as uh, for with regard to your postgrad work permit. So sometimes there, are, for example, if there, if it's a one year um, program, all of it could be outside. If it's a two year program, they want half of it to be in Canada, half of it to be outside Canada. A lot of these kind of rules, you should really check with your, uh, with the McMaster University as to, because different programs have their different um, requirements of a two year, one year, one and a half year, whatever it is, check with them to make sure that your program, if you're studying outside of Canada during these semesters will allow you to get your postgrad work permit afterwards. Um, if your classes are, um, canceled or you have to study part-time inside Canada because of COVID, uh, you can still maintain your student status and work part-time. Um, so this provision, it's carryover from the beginning of the pandemic when a lot of classes were canceled because of COVID. Right now though, I think most classes are not, they're, they're allowing you to study online. So, you know, if you had classes canceled before because of COVID, keep those records, right? Keep those um, uh, emails, okay? That your classes are canceled. Because one of, when we talk about the post-grad work permit, one of these, they're very, very strict, or at least they were before the pandemic, as to only giving post-grad work permits to those people who were attending, who are full-time students and attending classes full-time. So if you weren't, you really have to show evidence as to why it wasn't, you weren't attending, okay? If you're um, applying for a study permit inside Canada, currently you don't need to do biometrics right away. Maybe, you know, later it might be taken away, but for now you're exempt, okay? Um, like I said before, if you are currently in Canada and are out of status, but you had status on January 30th, you have until the end of the year to file your, your restoration of status. But normally the restoration of status period is only 90 days from the day that you lose your status. Okay, let's talk about studying and working on the study permit. First of all, okay, you have to actively pursue your studies. What does that mean, actively pursue your studies? 
It means that you are continuing to attend classes. You are registered as a full-time student, okay? Um, you can be a part-time student and lose, not lose your status, but that will affect your postgrad afterwards. But you, you know, in order to not lose it, you have to be registered as a student, you're attending classes, etc. cetera. Um, otherwise you lose your status within 90 days, okay? Now, there are two exceptions to the rule. One is the scheduled break. Scheduled breaks are, are something that is on the academic calendar that the school has for everybody. Authorized leave is something that you can ask the school to give you. And that is for special circumstances. And it's within, uh, you lose your status after 150 days. Like the, the authorized leave is only 150 days. So if you, if you need to, have authorized leave for longer than that, then um, you may need to file an extension of your visitor status, etc. Okay, the authorized leave is only allowed for 150 days, and it has to be given from the school. So make sure that you maintain your status. Sometimes people say, oh, well, it's COVID. I can't submit my application. No, online, you can do things online. Even by mail, you can submit it, although they may not process it for a while, okay? But as long as you submit your application properly, like we talked about before, you have your implied status until a decision is made, okay? So you can continue to study as long as you file that extension before your current study permit expires. Okay, so let's talk about working while you're studying. First of all, you can only work while you're a full-time student, except in the last semester. So some students, you know, you you've you just probably have one or two classes left um, that you just couldn't fit into the regular schedule. IRCC recognizes that. And if you just leave that until the last semester, then you um, can get your postgrad work right. You can also work full time during that last semester, and that's fine. Other than that, you have to be a full time student if you are going to be able to work. So, for example, if you get an authorized leave from the school, you can't work at all during the authorized leave because you're not registered as a full time student. Once you've completed your studies, you're no longer a student. So you cannot work from the day that you receive notice from the school that you completed your studies, okay? The first notice, whether it's your transcripts, you've, you know, you've received a transcript and it says you've completed your studies, um, or you've received a letter or email or whatnot. At that point, you're no longer a student, you have to stop working, okay? The only difference is if you're doing one program and you finish that program and you've already been accepted to another program that is going to start within 150 days. So for example, if I finish my undergrad program in April and I've been accepted to the master's program that's going to start in September, I can work because it's between 150 days, I can work during that summer in between. Other than that, if you're not, you haven't been accepted to another program, then you have to stop working um, once you've completed your program, okay? Uh, I said here during COVID time, you can work part-time if the classes are canceled because of COVID. That was more for people, you know, back in, in maybe March or April when a lot of classes were canceled. Now, if you're, most classes are online, so you no longer have that excuse, okay? All right, let's talk about the post-grad work permit. The first thing, question you should ask is not, you know, how or when I can apply for post-grad. The first question you should ask yourself is, should you apply for a post-grad work permit? Because the thing is, the post-grad work permit is a golden ticket, okay? you only get one golden ticket in your life. So a lot of people, they ask me once, you know, their postgrad is going to expire, they say, hey, Elizabeth, uh, tell me how I can extend my postgrad. It's, it's as if some people think it's as easy if I just fill in the forms, I have a job offer, I can extend it, right? 
No, you cannot just extend a work permit like that. You have to qualify for a work permit. Getting the post-grad work permit is rather easy for students to get it, okay? You graduate from your program and you apply and you get it. But most work permits are not that easy. In fact, for most people, in order to get another work permit, you would have to get the employer to do a LMIA where they have to try to recruit Canadians and show they can't find a Canadian who can do your job. For the most part, employers won't be willing to do that. Or even if they were willing to do that, they may not be able to get an approval because the work that you do may not be that specialized to convince an officer that no other Canadian can do your job, okay? So what you wanna do is make sure normally that you would be able to qualify for permanent residence with the work experience that you gain in Canada before your post-grad work permit expires. Now, the length of your post-grad work permit is very dependent on the length of your program. If your program is between eight to 12 months, you only get a work permit for that period of time. If your program is a two-year program or more, you can get a three-year work permit. Now this can get quite confusing for a lot of master's students because a lot of master's students, maybe your program is 16 months, but you don't, you don't actually get any scheduled breaks. And so IRCC has recognized that for a lot of master's students, um, if your program is less than the 24 months in total, but it's actually a two year program because you know, each academic year is normally eight months and you didn't get a schedule, any, any scheduled breaks for your program, then that is actually recognized as a two-year program. So that's something that is very important that you get a letter, uh, you know, from the department to specify that this is a two-year program so that you can get the three-year work permit. Um, you can also um, combine your program. So let's say you only did a one-year program. Well, then what can you do? You can do another one-year program. It doesn't even have to be another master's. You Maybe even you do another one-year program at a college, okay? But if you did one year plus one year, then you can get a three-year work permit at the end as well. So whether or not you need to do that, I'm not going to say you have to do that because some people don't need to do that. But whatever it is, you need to find out a plan, okay, as to whether or not you need to do that or not. Okay, so let's say you say, okay, yes, I'm going to go and apply for the postgraduate work permit. What do you need to do? Well, even before you go and apply, one of the very important things that you have to understand is that immigration has been very, very strict about issuing postgrad work permits for people only who have maintained full-time students status at school. If you have not, okay, if you have not, um, and you didn't have authorized leave, you know, sometimes people will come up to me and, and ask me, you know, Elizabeth, I have had such an issue this semester. Maybe something has happened to their family. Maybe something has happened to their health. And, you know, I just can't do a full-time semester. I'm just going to go to part-time and then maybe ask for a special exemption. What I might suggest to them is say, why don't you ask your school to give you authorized leave and take the entire semester off, okay? And then afterwards, come back fresh and then go to school full-time. If you did that, there's no question you're able to get either post-grad work permit at the end. But if you just did part-time, you really have to then explain to the officer why and hope, hope that the officer takes compassion on your case and gives you the post-grad work permit, okay? So it's not to say for sure that you won't get the post-grad work permit if you had you know, one or two semesters that were part-time, but you have to ask for special exemption. And if you don't provide 
uh, proper reasons and the officer doesn't take uh, compassion in your case, then your postgrad work grant for, could very well be rejected. Okay, there is an exemption for canceled classes during COVID. Like I said, keep proper evidence that your classes were canceled because of COVID. Okay, so let's talk about when. Okay, now here's the thing. The website says you have 180 days to apply for your postgrad work permit. But my advice to you is that you apply, and here's the rule that I want you to think, uh, remember, that you apply within 90 days of when you receive the first indication that you've completed your studies or when your study permit expires, whichever comes first, okay? Why do I say that it's not 180 days? It's because your student status is only valid for 90 days or when your study permit expires, um, you know, 90 days after your, you receive that notification, right? When you finish being a student, you only have 90 days. Otherwise, your student status expires. So if you apply 180 days or even 160 days, and you did not extend your status, et cetera, then what's going to happen is they will deny your postgrad work permit because you've lost your status at that point, okay? So apply within 90 days, or if your study permit expires before the 90 days, they apply before your study permit expires. If you do so, then you can work as soon as you apply. So, you know, right now, especially, it's taking very long to apply online for your work permit. And you don't have to wait until you receive the work permit in your hand. As long as you apply within 90 days or um, when your study permit is still uh, valid, you can actually start working right away, okay? And um, so that is very important because right now during COVID times, Unlike before, you can't do the flag polling. You can't just go um, to the border and go make a U-turn around the flagpole and come back and apply. Right now during COVID, they're not allowing that. Okay, so keep these rules in your, in your mind, okay? All right, now, Let's talk about permanent residence. The first thing I want to talk about is the express entry system, with, which many of you have probably already heard about. Um, the first uh, thing is you have to qualify to enter the pool for express entry. Okay, And in order to make an online profile, you have to qualify under one of three categories, federal skilled worker class, Canadian experience class, or the federal skilled trades class. Once you've made an online profile, you get to be entered into the express entry pool and you're gonna have a series of points based on your background. And if you have provincial nomination, that is express entry linked. Every two weeks or so, the government is going to announce a number in a draw. And if your number, your score is above that draw number, then you will receive an invitation to apply. And then you can actually apply for your uh, permanent residence. A lot of people tell me, oh, I've already applied for express entry. And I say, okay, when did you get your invitation to apply? Oh, I, I didn't get that yet. I'm just in the pool. If you're in the pool, you're not counted as having applied because you can be in the pool for up to a year and then your profile will expire, okay? That does not mean that you have applied for permanent residence. You're just in the pool. You can only apply after you receive the invitation to apply and then submit your application, okay? So let's talk about how to get into the pool. The first category many of you guys may already qualify for, and that's because for this category, people don't have to have any um, work experience in Canada. The work experience that's required for this one is one year of high skilled, full-time, which equals to 30 hours a week, 
continuous, no breaks in between, okay? Um, work experience in one occupation, okay? Note what I didn't say in here. I didn't say that you couldn't be a student while you gain this work experience. So if you are a master's or PhD student and you've done your TA and RA work and you have at least one year of continuous, so no uh, skipping one semester, for example, right? Continuous TA, RA work and you have the hours, at least 30 hours a week and it was paid work. Um, you were paid for your work there and it wasn't just like you were a scholar, you received a scholarship, okay? paid work experience, then you can uh, use that work experience to qualify you to get into the pool. This work experience does not give you extra Canadian work experience points to get out of the pool that we'll talk about later, but it can be enough to just qualify you to create a profile, okay? Other than that, you do need to pass the language exam IELTS of six, in each category, self if of seven. But this language exam may be enough to get you into the pool and may be too low to get out of the pool. You may need higher for that, okay? Um, other things, you need to have financial savings. Uh, normally we're looking at around 13,000 Canadian for one person, for additional family members, maybe a few thousand more for each additional family members. It does not have to be in a Canadian bank account but it has to be liquid, liquid funds and it has to be in your name, okay? Um, and then we take a look at your background. Normally, if you have your you know, degree and you have work experience, et cetera, you should have enough points to make it into the pool at that point. The second category that I want to talk about is the Canadian experience class. So this class is very different from the first skilled worker class. The work experience for this class is as follows. One year out of the three years from the time that you've applied for, uh, you know, for permanent residence, one year of work experience in Canada that is high skilled and it, it is full, you have the 1,560 hours, which equals to 30 hours a week, and that you are employed, okay? So what's the difference with the first one? First of all, it has to be in Canada. Oh, it can't be when you gained when you are a student, a full-time student, okay? So it would be mostly, you know, when you've gained it outside, of, like when you've completed your, your school, and then you get it through the post-grad work permit, or even the work experience that you get while waiting for the post-grad work permit and you've applied for your post-grad work permit. Okay, you can count that as well. Um, or your spouses, they can get their spousal work permit and gain work experience because they're not studying full-time, okay? So work experience that is not when you're a full-time student, um, you have to be employed. You can't use self-employment work. The first one you can, federal skilled worker you can. Canadian experience class, you're not allowed to use self-employment work, okay? Um, so you should look for a T4 from your employer at the end of the year. Um, usually they issue it in February, okay? Um, it does not have to be continuous. It can also be in different occupations as well. So this work experience is very, very different from the federal skilled worker class. Other than that, you do have to do a language exam, which is similar, going to be similar to the level for the federal skilled worker class. This one does not require any financial savings under this class. You can enter the pool under any, you can qualify under any class, okay? There's a third one called skill trades. I'm not gonna to talk too much about that. That's for people who are in the construction trades or also cooks and chefs as well. Okay, so let's say that you know, you're in the pool. Here I have four people who, as examples in the pool, and they all have different CRS scores. Now, the draws for the most part have been around the 470. So let's say the last draw was 471. Who's gonna get through? Well, you say Trupti, 
Okay, that's fine. Now, in around the March to June of this year, IRCC had this idea that they didn't want to invite everybody in the pool. They wanted to target specific um, uh, qualifications. So they wanted to allow for some time only people who qualify under Canadian experience class to uh, uh, be drawn out of the pool. So in that case, let's say Troop T only qualified under, under federal skilled worker class she wouldn't be invited to apply, even though her score is above that score. Because of this, that's why for time between March and June, the scores for um, the draws, when they were only targeting Canadian experience class applicants, were dropping to as low as, I think, in the 30s, 430, I, I can't remember the exact, of, but in the 430s, whereas right now it's 470s, okay? You never know, you never know if your score might be good enough. Okay. All right, let's talk about what gives you those CRS scores. The first thing is age. Your age is the highest when you are in the 20s. In the 30s, your points start dropping by five or six points. In the 40s, you're dropping by, you know, fast slide down 10 points, 11 points, etc. And then, uh, you know, by your 45th birthday, you are, um, your points are going to be zero. Okay. Um, the good thing is it doesn't go down anymore. But the bad news is compared to someone who has 110, 100 points in their 20s, uh, you're losing out a lot in on the age part. Not a lot you can do about your age. You just have to apply as early as you can. Education is another thing. So um, you guys, if you have your master's or PhD, you guys are in a much, you, your points would jump because you have two degrees. Sometimes I have people who are super, super smart and they go from the bachelor's to the PhD and skip the master's, right? That on the immigration side can be a downfall though, because you don't have your master's, then you're, and you're just working towards your PhD, then if you wanna apply while you know, you're doing your PhD, so you don't have your PhD yet, then your education is assessed as only having a bachelor's degree, okay? Um, language points are very, very important. Normally, if you don't have work experience points in Canada, work experience points, we're looking at a score of at least sevens in reading, writing, and speaking, eight in listening for IELTS, or nines in everything for CELPIP. Relevant Canadian work experience. Um, that's the work experience that I was talking about in relation to the Canadian experience class. So the work experience is within the last 10 years though, um, that is employed work experience in Canada where you're not a full-time student and that's high skilled, okay? So let's say you get your postgrad or you, know, you apply for your postgrad and you work for one year after you finish studying, that's what gives you a boost. And that's why um, international students have such an advantage. That postgrad work permit, like I said, is your golden ticket and could very well uh, be your golden ticket towards permanent residence. So don't waste that ticket. If you have foreign work experience, work experience outside of Canada that's high skilled, we can count points as well. So if you've done, you know, RATA work outside of Canada, that could be very, very valuable as well. Okay. If you have a spouse, um, sometimes if they're added to your, uh, uh, your, your application as a company dependent, then your score could may drop a little bit, or if they have a high level of education, they have high level language, um, et cetera, they could add a little bit. Provincial nominee programs. We're gonna talk a little bit about that for the Ontario program. Um, 
it's not every provincial nominee program that will give you 600 points for express entry. It has to be an express entry linked provincial nominee program. Um, previous study in Canada. So if you've done your master's or PhD, you get additional 30 points in Canada. Arranged employment. People think, oh, I have a job offer. Therefore I have arranged employment, right? No, if you have a open work permit, like the postgrad work permit, you do not have arranged employment. It's only for people who have an LMIA or employer specific work permit. If you have siblings who are Canadians or permanent residents in Canada, you can get 15 points for that. And they've actually just raised the additional points you can get if you can speak fluent French as well. Um, so, uh, you know, you'll see from this that French speakers are very, very much favored with regard to permanent residence. And, you know, if you can speak French, you, we can also even get you a employer specific work permit uh, for arranged employment as well, if you have a high skilled job outside of Quebec. Okay, so that's a real advantage there. And a trade certification, it's not any trades, it's mostly trades uh, certification in the um, construction trades and maybe uh, chefs as well. Okay, so let's say your points that are, you know, previously there may not be enough to get you to where the draws are drawing, which is normally at around the 470s right now. Okay, maybe it's increased even more if all these people want to come from the states because of the election or who knows, okay? It's a competition to see whoever is in the pool, they will have a... Um, they, they usually want to select 3,000 to 4,000 of the top people in the pool. Okay, so you're kind of competing with who, el who else are in the pool. So, um, if we, uh, Ontario has some programs that are express entry linked, where if you are currently in the express entry pool, they may tell you, I like you, I, I'm going to send you an expression of interest, and then you can apply with us. And if they do that and you apply with them, you get 600 more points added to your score for express entry. Okay. Um, you can't just apply directly with OIMP. They have to like you. So I kind of say it's kind of like, um, you know, the dating site Bumble. I've never been on it. People just tell me about it. Okay, it's basically uh, the one where I think it, this is how it goes. The men can't contact the women directly. They can be in the site and then women, if they like the men, they contact them, then they can start interacting. Same thing with this. You can't contact the Ontario government and say, I want to apply with you. You have to be in the pool and then they see, okay, we like you. Now you can go and uh, apply with them. Okay, so how do you, who do they like in this pool, right? Here are some of the categories. The first one, the human capital uh, one is probably the most ubiquitous. It's, you know, you, you can ask them who's going to be drawn under the human capital. We normally meet with them a few times a year. In fact, Zia meets with them um, a lot because she's on the committee. Uh, for the uh, provincial nominee program for OIMP and she uh, for, for the bar, uh, the Ontario Bar Association and she does meet with them quite a bit. And one of the things that, you know, we always ask them say, hey, who do you think you're going to be selecting for human capital draws? And they say, well, we don't really know. We're thinking about it. Um, in the past, they have invited people who have occupations, specific occupations, they have specified that they really like people in the tech industry and they have something called the tech draws where they, if you have um, a background in one of the tech um, occupations and your score is above number, okay? So for example, they might invite people in the tech, they might do a tech draw um, and have it at people over 463. 
Okay, so if your number is 463 um, and or above, your score and you you know it's probably slightly under the 470s you'd be in the pool and they can invite you to apply with them for 600 points but you also have to have that occupation um, as part of your work experience there are other occupations sometimes that they need they don't announce those other occupations beforehand but if they like you and they see you they might invite you to apply okay sometimes in the before they invited people who have job offers. You never really know who they really like otherwise. Um, skilled trades, these are for people who um, have been in the construction trades mainly, um, and they worked in Canada, Ontario for one year, um, and then they might also be invited to apply. And again, French speakers, French speakers who are fluent, um, I, I mean, it's, the fluency is probably the same as an IELTS of six uh, for the French speaking part. Um, and then of course the English also has to be uh, IELTS of probably around 5.5. Um, they can also be invited to apply as well. Okay, although they may not need to because if they had that, then they have all these extra points in express entry anyway. Lucky French people. All right. Now, um, enough of the express entry, okay? I know a lot of you might be really happy about it and a lot of you might not be so happy about it. Let's talk about some other options. Um, I wanna talk about the employer-based uh, programs. Uh, so these are programs where if you have an employer in Ontario, and it depends on where they're located, if it's inside GTA, they have to have a gross income of 1 million, have five full-time Canadian or permanent resident employees and be in business for three years. If they're outside of the GTA, they have to have a gross income of 500,000, have three full-time Canadian or permanent resident employees and be in business for three years. And the job offer has to be full-time and permanent, okay? First of all, you need a job offer like that. Now, then there are three categories under this sort of employer-based stream. There is an international student class. So if you apply within two years of graduation, okay, uh, from McMaster, you don't even need to have any work experience. You can apply as long as your job offer is high skilled and it meets entry level wage. The second one is for skilled workers. And you can apply after two years of graduation. You don't even have to have graduated in Ontario, uh, but you, in, for those you need two years of work experience in the last five years so, and meet median wage. So oftentimes I find that spouses of students may qualify under this. And then uh, in demand is for the low skilled occupations that are on a list um, that they have nine months of work experience in those occupations that you can apply, okay? Now, what has been happening in the past two years is that these categories have been extremely, well, in-demand is usually open, but the international student and what they call the foreign worker stream have been so crazy in their popularity that they only open for something like 15 minutes, 30 minutes. And during that time, it's like buying tickets on Ticketmaster. You know, we have everybody just going on the internet, click. It's like, you know, I was saying to Zia the other day, it was like I'm back in the nineties, just watching the wheel of death go round and round on the thing and trying to be able to log in during that very, very short window of time when it's open. Next year, what's going to happen is the government is going to get rid of the first come first serve and they're going to put in a an EOI system and what that's going to be is going to be kind of like the express entry where people who qualify they're going to get into a pool and then they're going to be screened um, based on points based on their background for you guys I think you guys probably 
um, may do well on that. It's not going to be exactly the same criteria we hope as express entry and things like age and stuff may not matter as much. Um, but we'll see. Um, if we have a, a newsletter and we can sign you guys up on the newsletter and we provide news on these kind of new systems and new changes to the law um, as they come. So we can sign you up and if you don't like it, you can feel free to unsubscribe. But we find that most people like to get news on, on these things, okay? Master's and PhD stream. PhD has been open, that's not a problem, but master stream has been like what I said with the buying tickets on Ticketmaster situation. It's been like that for the past, I'd say four years or five years or so. And this year, I think it opened once only. Um, so next year, they're also going to um, have an EOI system for the master stream where people who qualify, they're then going to be selected based on points as well, okay? But for this one, it's very important that you have to apply within two years of your graduation. Otherwise, you can't apply uh, uh, for this. You can only apply when the program is open right now. Next year, they're gonna have an EOI system. Master's, you have to get your IELTS or CELPIP. Um, it's at the level of six for IELTS and CELPIP is seven. So most of you, I think, shouldn't have too much of an issue for that. For the master stream, it does require that you have some settlement funds as well, okay? And like I said, next year, you have to have, there is a new EOI system for the master stream. Okay, I just wanted to tell you guys about one more thing that I think some of you may be interested in, especially if you're very entrepreneurial, um, and that's the startup visa. So under this program, up to five founders can apply, okay? So it can be you and four other partners. Every person uh, who is applying, who has to own at least 10% of the business and together, everybody who applies should own a majority shares in the company. Every person has to pass an English level of five or a French level of five. And each person has to have an active management role in the company. You don't have to be doing the same thing. In fact, we like people doing different management roles in the company, but you have to show that you're all going to be actively managing. It's not a passive investment situation, okay? And if you have a startup a, a company that is innovative, then you, then you have to get a letter of support from a designated organization. So these are organizations that are on the list by IRCC. OK, um, it could be an incubator, an angel investor group or a venture capital group. And if these organizations like your company, then uh, they give you a letter of support, then you can apply for permanent residence. OK, so these kind of situations, if you have something, if you're working on a really innovative, uh, you know, a company that, you know, maybe you're doing it with an incubator, um, let, let us know and we can probably work with you on that. Not all incubators are part of the program and not all incubators even that are listed on the government site actually do this. Um, but there are, there are some, you know, uh, angel investor groups, for example, um, or and incubators that we do work with that may very well like what you're doing and give you the letter of support. All right. Next steps, what should you do after all this? The first one I would say is you have to have a plan. You know, immigration I would say is 50% uh, execution, 50% planning. And if you don't know what you need to do, how are you going to go ahead and do it? And that includes not listening to just your friends, okay? Everybody's situation is different. And immigration laws in Canada change very often. Your friends may, whatever they did may have worked for them, but it very well may not work for you. And I also don't think you should trust your life to online forums as well. And just, you know, listen to whatever people, who knows who they are, as saying on online forums. You have to have a plan. Um, 
with a qualified lawyer to go through your goals, okay? Second thing is once you know what your plan is, it's not normally that easy to get there, okay? You may have to do some things to get there. You study and take your practice exams for IELTS. Um, you know, a lot of people, they think, oh, it's my first language. I'm fluent in language. I, I was educated in English. Of course, I'm going to get really high scores. And my, uh, you know, what I would say to you is, you know what? Maybe you can, but a lot of times these tests test your ability to do the exam and not necessarily your ability in the language. Okay, so it doesn't hurt to at least know what you're getting yourself into, do some practice exams because the difference between a 0.5 on the results of one of these things can be the difference between you being able to get enough points for express entry and not being able to get enough points for express entry, okay? Um, and make sure that, you know, you have the programs that you need, the study programs, enough time on your work permit to get the Canadian work experience. Just because you qualify for a one-year post-grad work permit doesn't necessarily mean that you should just go and apply for it right away. Or let's say you're doing your undergrad and then later on you want to do your master's. Some people make the mistake of, oh, I qualify for post-grad work permit when I finish my undergrad, I'm going to get my post-grad work permit and I really want to do a master's. So then I'm going to do my master's while I have the post-grad work permit. And then you can't actually utilize the work permit to get the work experience that you need. Okay, so first thing, planning. Second thing, execution. Third thing that I want to advise you guys is make sure you're staying in status. We're not playing around with immigration. Immigration does not play around. They have very little tolerance. Uh, for any mistakes, okay? Make sure you have that date of expiry on your study permit. You know when you need to apply for your post-grad work permit very clearly in your head and don't work or study illegally and stay in status. Because if you miss those deadlines, you'd be surprised at how many students or people who come to me after years of being in Canada illegally just because they missed a deadline for extending their study permit. And then they, they didn't know what to do, okay? Also, please, please don't misrepresent. Misrepresentation is taken very, very seriously by immigration. If they find that you misrepresented, you are barred from being in Canada, uh, applying for Canada uh, Canadian permanent residence for five years. Also, also, um, you will have that record on your hand. So even later on, if you want to apply for something, your credibility is shot. And, you know, people say, well, they're never going to, they, they probably won't find out. But you'd be surprised, you know, they have cracked down, for example, on consultants who have, you know, they, they later on knew that they were telling all their clients to lie. They pulled their file records and then they investigated every single person. And even if you received your Canadian citizenship, they might come back to you and pull, take away your Canadian citizenship. So it's not worth it. It's not in your best interest to make misrepresent. You guys are in some of the best possible situations to, to apply under these kind of programs. So make sure you do one, two, and three, um, and keep these in mind. And finally, if your application is rejected, contact a lawyer right away, okay? There are very strict federal court filing rules. 15 days from the date of rejection, we have to file the notice. If you miss that deadline, you can't later on come to me and say, hey, you know what, it was really unfair, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, I can't do anything at that point because even if the officer was wrong, it's beyond the time when you can go to federal court. The other thing is, you know, a lot of people were used to calling the call center, complaining to the call center and getting people to fix it, right? You have, you bought something wrong on Amazon or Amazon screwed up on your delivery. You call Amazon call center, they fix it. 
immigration call center is not the same as an Amazon call center, okay? Immigration call center may tell you things, but if you rely on them to your own detriment, then you rely on them to your own detriment. If you call a call center because something went wrong in your application, they are likely going to say, okay, write us a letter and explain, okay? Okay, so you go and write them a letter and explain, even though you don't really know, for example, what happened or why it is your it was rejected, and why under the law it should you should get it, right? And so then immigration rejects your reconsideration. Once you write back to them, you're asking for them to take another look. It's called a reconsideration. So then you you might come to me and say, Elizabeth, you know, um uh, I got it denied here. What should I, can you just then go and write them a letter? Because you're the expert, you should be able to do so. At that point, I can say to you, you know, if you had come to me first, I can certainly have, you know, put in a reconsideration. However, you've already put in a reconsideration and IRCC, when they, if they receive something from me, they're going to say, you already submit a reconsideration. We're not even gonna read what you uh, submit, okay? So make sure that you, once it's rejected, just contact a lawyer right away. Don't even try to fix it yourself because you might just be digging your hole deeper and deeper. Um, finally as well, you have to be aware that once your application is rejected, restoration of status timelines may very well kick in. And if you wait too long, you may be out of time to apply for your postgrad work permit again, okay? So um, these are some of the things to keep in mind. All right, um, this is uh, the, um, uh, this is our, some of the information. If you have questions, please do let us know. And um, we have a COVID update page here. And if you want to schedule a time for your consultation, please feel free to email us and let us know you've attended the seminar um, and we will always give you then a discounted rate for your uh, consultation, okay? Um, all right, Zia, what kind of questions do we have? Well, we've gotten some great questions, Elizabeth. Um, to start, there's quite a bit of questions around traveling right now. So with mm -hmm. COVID and, and traveling. Um, so the first one is if you are already in Canada, and want to go home to visit family, hmm. will you be able to come back assuming you hold a study permit and the study permit is still valid? Normally, yes, uh, you can, okay? Um, if you can show the officer that you live in Canada, right, and you have your study permit, then normally, A, you have your study permit um, and you know, the, the, the airline will let you into Canada uh, on the flight and normally the officers will let you in. However, if I were you, if you really don't need to travel, my advice is I wouldn't travel because you never know what might happen. You know, not all airlines and officers really follow the law per se to, you know, their interpretation may be very different, right? Maybe you might not be able to get a flight back and at which time you're stuck over there for a long period of time. And then how you show that you actually live in Canada, you know, at that time. So there's a lot of things that could go wrong. Hopefully they don't, but there is a risk that during these times, um, if you don't need to, to travel, my advice would be don't travel. Perfect. And if someone is outside of Canada and they have their work permit approved, but they have not yet received the physical work permit, will they be able to travel to Canada? So let's say it's a spouse of an international student. Yes. So if, you if your spouse has a work permit approved, and they, uh, they can show that work permit approval letter, they can get on the plane to get on the plane to Canada. And then when they come into Canada, they show that the work permit approval letter there. And they also have to show that 
they're joining you in Canada. So you, you're, for example, in Canada studying, etc., and their relationship to you at the borders, okay? And also you should have an isolation plan ready for them to tell. And I think right now they've actually had a new system that's set up where you have to just go into it and register your isolation plan as well. Um, that's coming so, into place after November 20th, I think. November 20th, okay, okay, great, yeah. So those are some of the things, you know, traveling right now is just really, uh, really crazy with regard to all of these rules with COVID. And these things are changing all of the time. You know, this whole registration system, I just saw it uh, yesterday when I was uh, reviewing things. And so a lot of these changes are happening a lot. We do try to keep up with it. You can go on the IRCC website and see if we can find uh, some of these things. Uh, we do try to keep up with it for the most part on the update page and our update page to so see if there are some updates there. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes with the travel, it can get very confusing because you're not only dealing with officers at the border, you actually have to get on the plane. So you have to deal with these airline, um, you, you know, attendants and etc. to see if they can understand the Canadian convoluted immigration laws as well. Perfect. Looking at permanent residents, um, if an individual completes an internship, can they use this internship as work experience for their PR application? And the second part to that is, does it matter if this internship is completed during their program or after their program of study in Canada? So the internship, if it's be while you're studying, you can use it to qualify you to get into the pool for federal skilled work request, but it won't give you the points afterwards. Now, if it's after you've graduated and the internships have to be paid, otherwise it's just not counted as work experience at all, okay? But if you're paid intern uh, after you've graduated, then we could use that. It doesn't matter what you're called as long as the duties that you do fit within a high-skilled um, knock code, then we can certainly count that. Okay, great. And does it matter, is there a difference between someone who is on a part-time contract, someone who is on an internship um, versus someone who has a permanent position? Um, so for the Canadian experience class, it doesn't matter whether or not the work that you've been doing was on a contract or permanent position. What I'm talking about with a contractor or an employee is very different. A contractor, it doesn't mean that you're just a person on a contract. A contractor means you're not really an employee of the company. For example, I'm hiring somebody to paint my house, okay? That person, I, you say, I say, give me a quote, how much it is to paint the house? They say, okay, you know, $1,000 to paint this room, fine. Okay, I'm gonna give him $1,000. I'm not gonna take any CPPEI income tax deduction off the $1,000 I give him, right? Because he is not an employee of mine. He's a contractor. Similarly, if you go and you work for a company and they say, we want to hire you on a contractor basis, we're not going to uh, deduct anything off your paycheck then that could be very problematic afterwards when we want to get points for your Canadian work experience for, ex for uh, express entry, okay? So in order to get the Canadian experience points, you need to have those deductions. Now, if you get those deductions, but you only get a one-year contract, you only get a six-month contract, fine, we can count that work experience. Maybe you need to find another job afterwards to get more work experience under your belt. That's fine. But we can count that if you are an employee and you get those deductions off of your paycheck. So what if I'm using different positions? Like I, I've worked in multiple different roles and they would fall under different knock codes. That's fine for Canadian work experience as long as you're using that um, to qualify, to get the points and you're qualified under Canadian experience class. And this is after you've graduated. Okay. Going back to the post-grad work permit, um, 
when so you mentioned that there are timelines right and there are deadlines to apply for that postgrad work permit can you go over that and what starts that timeline mm -hmm. so let's say that you are doing your final exam and you finished your final exams you don't have your grades yet that means you're still a full-time student you're still registered as a full-time student you can work part-time during that time okay when you do get your grades and it shows that you've passed all of your programs that's your if that's your first indication maybe you get an email maybe you get something on your profile your work whatever it is and it doesn't count if you don't check your email too okay <laughs> it's the first time it's available to you okay and at that point uh then you have to stop working because you're no longer a full-time student okay then if you at that point you need to work you can apply for your postgrad work permit as soon as you submit your application for your postgrad work permit remember my rule 90 days from the date you get the notice and uh you know before your study permit expires okay you submit it at that point then you can start working full-time right away perfect and so if I, I have to go and check my grades, what if I don't decide to check my grades? Does that mean that I haven't been notified? Don't use that trick, okay? Don't say, I'm never, I'm gonna check, not gonna check my grades until one year later, okay? And then that's okay. No, okay? It's when it becomes available to you, don't play fast and loose with these kind of rules. You'll never win with immigration, okay? So <laughs> go by the date that it's available to you and you know, stop working on that date. And then later on, when you do get the, um, you can apply for your work permit, then apply for it and you can continue to work. Now you're, um, while you're waiting for your work permit, your social insurance number may expire during that time, especially now I think it's taking around five months to get a work permit. Don't worry about that. Your employer can continue to do the payroll deductions and give you under that social insurance number because you're going to have the same social insurance number once your work permit is issued. It's just going to be the expiry date is going to be extended. Okay, so you can continue to use that social insurance number even if the expiry date ha has, has come and gone. Perfect. Uh, Elizabeth, we've gotten some questions about the OINP masters and PhD streams. Mm -hmm. Um, does it require you to go into the express entry pool first? No, the master's and PhD streams are completely separate from express entry. Express entry is not the only way to apply for permanent residence. Express entry is only one way to apply for permanent residence. I talked about non-express entry based programs like the employer based OIMP programs like master's and PhD streams, like the startup visas. Those are different programs for an express entry and you don't go through express entry at all. So if you don't have to go through express entry, um, how do you, once you get that nomination, then what is the process for permanent residence? Right, so the OIMPs, whether it's employer-based or master's or PhD streams, you apply to the Ontario government first, and then once you get um, approval, you get a nomination certificate. With that nomination certificate, you then apply to, for your permanent residence with IRCC. And the thing is with those kind of programs, it take, may take a little bit longer because the, uh, the OIMP, the Ontario government is pretty good. Maybe around three months, you, you probably get a decision, but the federal government can take a long time. I think the last time I checked was 21 months right now. I think it's stretched because of COVID. Um, whereas express entry, now you have to actually get the invitation to apply. If you don't get the invitation to apply, you can stay in the pool forever, right? Well, you stay in the pool for one year and then it expires and you have to redo it again. So if you can get out and get the invitation to apply, uh, it takes normally six months with COVID, it might stretch to a little bit longer, um, but it generally may be a lot faster than the other streams for OIMP. So 
you know, when people are asking me, should I do the master's? I have a job offer. Should I go for the master's? Um, it depends on their situation. If you can get through express entry, maybe it's faster to go through express entry, but maybe you have to work for a year. Whereas with master's, you can apply right now. So you kind of have to weigh those kind of factors and you can do two as well. People ask me, can I hedge my bets and do two? You can do two. You only get one permanent residence at the end. You have to choose which one you want to go for at the end. But if you have the means to do two, it is possible to hedge your bets and do two as well. So many different options to consider. Yes. <laughs> for sure. um, one last question, Elizabeth. Um, if someone takes a leave of absence from their studies, does that affect a spouse who's on an open spousal work permit? No. Um, for the most part, if your work, your spouse has a work permit, then that work permit is good until it expires. So even if you finish your program of study before your study permit expires, some people, they get their study permits issued for a much longer time than it takes for, for you to finish your program. Um, your spouse's work permit is good until it expires. So even though your study period will end and you're uh, 90 days, your student status will end 90 days from the time you're, you finished your uh, studies, your spouse's um, continue on until it actually, the actual expiry date. Now, if you need to extend your spouse's work permit, you have to have a high skilled job offer in order for them to extend their work permit. Perfect, thanks Elizabeth. All right, I think um, that's it for today. So thank you guys all for coming. Thank you JC for hosting us as well. No, thank you, thank you to you guys, that's super helpful. I think I've seen your presentation four or five times now and yeah. every time there's a little bit that changes so that's that's really interesting and oh, as uh, yeah thank you for answering the question i've been on your in your shoes answering questions during those webinars and i know it's stressful so thank you so much my awesome. pleasure <laughs> awesome well thank you guys all um what hope you have a wonderful evening and take care and stay safe take care guys bye bye <laughs>